Okay. Oh, I need tape. So today we are going to talk about uh, space groups. And the difference between space groups and point groups is that we also include translational elements of symmetry. Okay? So can you remember the sort of uh, symmetry elements which also had translations? Can you give me two examples of symmetry elements which include translations? Glide. Yeah? And so. Screw. And Glide. Yeah, that's right. So we had the screw axis, which means you rotate and you translate at the same time. And then we had the mirror plane, but include a translation. Okay, so you reflect and then include a translation. So that's called a glide plane. So here you are. These are the rotation axes, the monad, dyad, triad, tetrad, and hexad. And these are the screw axes. Now the meaning of this symbol is that here we rotate by 180 degrees and then we translate by half a lattice repeat. Okay, so one upon two of the lattice repeat. Here we rotate by 120 degrees and then translate by one third of the repeat distance. Here we translate by two thirds of the repeat distance and so on. So the meaning of the symbol is that we rotate by 90 degrees, it's a normal tetrad, and then translate by three quarters, three over four, of the repeat distance along the axis. Okay? And these are your inversion axes, where you rotate by 180 degrees and then invert through the center. So this is not a, uh, that's, that's still a point group element. Glide planes means reflection and then translation. And the nature of that translation determines whether you label them A, B, C, N, and D. I'll come back to this later on. So here we are. This is a, a screw dyad. And you can see that if, as I travel along this dyad, this is my repeat distance, isn't it? Yeah, so the distance between two lattice points on that axis. So I rotate this by 180 degrees, and I translate a half along here. So that's labeled as 2 with a subscript 1. Okay? So the translation is 1 divided by 2. And this is a glide plane. I reflect on this plane, and then translate by half a distance along, uh, along this repeat direction. Okay? So that's the meaning of a glide plane. Right, so here is a more detailed illustration of the different kinds of uh, screw tetrads. So this is a, a simple fourfold axis of rotation. So if I take this object and I turn it through 90 degrees, I recover exactly the same structure. Okay? On the other hand, if I rotate through 90 degrees, I don't get anything here. Right? But if I then translate by a quarter of the repeat distance, so this is the repeat distance here. If I translate by a quarter, so rotate by 90, translate by a quarter, I recover this position. Yeah? So this is a 4 with a subscript 1. Here, if I rotate by 90 degrees, I've got to translate by half the repeat distance. So it's 2 upon 4 of the repeat distance. And this is 3 upon 4. So I translate by 90, uh, rotate by 90 degrees, and then translate by 3 quarters of the repeat distance. Yeah? So is everybody happy with this notation? Yeah. Here, it's 3 quarters of the repeat distance, uh, half a quarter. Yeah, straightforward. So these are called screw axes for obvious reasons. Yeah? OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the structure of cuprite. Cuprite is uh, copper oxide, Cu2O. You can see its uh, structure in three dimensions here. Um, so f first thing I'd like you to tell me, this is Cu2O, all right? copper oxide. Which are the copper atoms and which are the oxygen atoms? So the structure is Cu2O. Sorry? Yeah, and why do you say white ones? You're right. Because the red one is the 
this is structural. Red one. Uh -huh. So two atoms are included in a new cell. Correct, that's the thing. So with the red one, you've got one atom in the center, and you've got one atom at the corner, because the corner atoms only a one eighth of that belongs to the cell. It's shared between eight cells. So we have two, two oxygen atoms inside the cell, and we have four of the copper atoms inside the cell. Okay. So what we are going to do is we are going to work out the space group symmetry of this structure very gently as we go through the lecture. It looks like a very simple structure, but it's got a lot of uh, interesting features. Um, and the second question is, uh, what kind of a cube is this? Is this cubic P, is it cubic I, or cubic F? Cubic, hmm? cubic I. Okay, let, let's try and work that out, because in a three-dimensional perspective, it's very difficult to imagine where the lattice points are, right? So what would you do to make it simpler? Hmm? It, uh, so, what did somebody say? Yeah, projection along the z-axis. And when we do a projection, it's good to draw four unit cells together, because then you can see the environment much more clearly. So this is the projection, and here are four unit cells drawn, and just to remind you, whenever there's no label, it's at zero and one height, and this is at a half height because that's at the body center. This is at three quarters because the bonds are pointing upwards from this uh, uh, oxygen atom, and these are at quarter with the bonds pointing downwards. So the first question to ask, yeah, if you, if you think this is a body centered, is, is the environment of this atom the same as the environment of this? If the environment here is exactly the same as the environment here, then uh, those are two lattice points. Yeah. So any ideas? Yeah? Jun? They are not, because you're right. In the center of the red pole is the center of the one and two. Yeah, so here you see this is at a height half, and these two atoms are pointing upwards. Yeah, because they are at three quarters. If you look at this atom, which is at zero or one, then these are pointing downwards. So these are not equivalent positions. So this is actually uh, what kind of a lattice would you call it? P, primitive. Yeah, so there's only one lattice point per cell. And the motif is, is actually uh, a collection of eight atoms. So you place eight atoms at every lattice point to generate this structure. So here you are. This is a primitive cubic unicell. And at every lattice point, you put this collection of atoms. So one copper atom at a quarter, quarter, three quarters, quarter, quarter, three quarters, uh, sorry, bar quarter, bar, quarter, three quarters, and so on. And the oxygen atom at zero, plus an oxygen atom at half, half, half. Yeah. So, so notice how, how elegant that equation that we derived was, that crystal structure equals lattice plus motif. Yeah? I mean, to imagine this structure in three dimensions is, is not worth it. All you need to understand is that this is a cubic P lattice, and that you place this cluster of atoms at every lattice point. Okay. So, so far this is the most complicated motif that we've dealt with, but it can consist of many, many more atoms placed at each lattice point. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the structure of uranium, it's really complicated. Something like 56 atoms per unit cell. Okay. Okay, so we've got one element of the symmetry of this, that this is a cubic P lattice, uh, and we place a motif of these atoms at each lattice point to generate the entire crystal structure. Right, now, uh, wh what I'd like you to do is tell me where I can find a glide axis. 
Okay. Unfortunately, I put it up on the screen just a minute ago. <laughs> uh, so, can you see that there is a glide axis, uh, a screw axis here? Yeah. Uh, what what kind of a screw axis is it? So if I, if I put a, a, an axis here and I rotate by 90 degrees, I don't recover an, an atom at a quarter. But if I then translate by half, then I recover the position. So it's a screw tetrad. Okay. So we've got a rotation by 90 degrees about here. So quarter goes again to this height quarter and then translation vertically by half the unit cell. And therefore, it's a 4-2 screw axis. Everybody happy with that? So that's a screw axis. Now, supposing that you're looking just at the shape of the crystal, what would that axis become? So we're not interested in, uh, when we're looking at macroscopic objects, yeah? translations of half a lattice parameter are not going to be obvious, right? So that would simply look as if it's a fourfold axis of rotation. We lose the translational elements of symmetry if we are looking at the object macroscopically, right? So the point group equivalent of that axis is simply a tetrad. Now, is there a glide plane that you can see? That means a reflection followed by a translation. So I'll give you a, a hint. It's parallel to one of the edges, or, or two of the edges, or three of the edges, because it's a cube. Focus on the, the red atoms, okay? And think about it as a mirror plane, but when you reflect, you don't get anything at that position, so you have to add a translation. So it's going to be parallel to one of these edges here. Yep. A quarter of the uh, unit cell above the edge. Right. So if I if I take this as the edge, yeah, yes. then it would be here, right? Yes. Yeah, because look, if I, if I put a glide plane here and I reflect through there, I get nothing here at 0 and 1. Yeah? So in order to uh, recover, I have to go half along here and half vertically. So this is what's known as a diagonal glide plane, where you reflect and then you translate that and that. Okay? So let me just draw that in. Okay, I've, I've sort of jumped the gun, but uh, I'll... I'll show you that later, OK? We'll come back to the glide plane in a minute. OK, now these are the operations of the other screw axis. So this is a 2-1. If I rotate by 180 degrees, I've got to translate by half a repeat distance to recover the object. Similarly here, by 120 degrees and translation by a third. 120 degrees and translation by 2 thirds. This is a six-fold axis, so a rotation of 60 degrees followed by translation of 1 sixth. 
And obviously, I will have another set of six-fold axes. Here, for example, we rotate by 60 degrees and translate by five-sixths of the repeat distance. Okay? So the number of screw axes increases as the symmetry of that axis increases. Yeah? Right, so the glide planes that we discussed. Um, the operation is very simple. We start with this, we reflect, and then we translate along here. And there are different kinds of glide axes. So supposing A, B, and C are our lattice parameters. Yeah? If we are translating only half a distance along A, or half a distance along B, or half a distance along C, then that's known as axial glide. Yeah? So that's just one translation. Diagonal glide is what we just did with cuprite, that there's a combination of translations. That means half along A and half along C, or half along A and half along B, and so on. And the label for diagonal glide is N, small n. Diamond glide uh, is a combination of two edges of the unit cell, but a quarter of the distance. Okay? Uh, and for that, the symbol is D. Alternatively, if you combine all uh, translations along all three of the unit cell edges by a quarter of the repeat distance, that's also diamond glide. Okay? So th these are specific to the FCC and BCC lattices. So the symbols, the space group symbols for glide planes are either when there is a translation along one edge, so you label it as A, B, or C, uh, when there is translation along two edges, in which case it's an N glide plane, or a diamond glide plane when it's a translations of a quarter. Okay? So this is simply the notation. And in this structure, here we have an N glide plane. Okay? Because look, I reflect by a half, then I and that atom is located at zero height, translate by half along here, and then half vertically. So that's an N-glide plane. So now our space group symbol is we have the primitive lattice, and we have an N-glide plane as well. Okay, so we are building up the space group symbol for this crystal structure. Everybody happy so far? Now, does this structure have a center of symmetry? Okay. So th this is uh, the unit cell that I had drawn. And all I've done in drawing this diagram is I've shifted the origin to one of the copper atoms instead of the oxygen atoms to help you to answer that question on whether it has a center of symmetry. So this is exactly the same crystal. But here, the unit cell is drawn with the origin at the copper atom instead of the oxygen atom. Yeah, yeah it, it does. You, you can see that you can invert any atom through the center and get another one at the other end. Whether it's this one, this one, this one, you go through the center, you'll recover another atom at the position, okay? So this means that this will not be piezoelectric or pyroelectric or ferroelectric. Copper oxide will not have those special properties that we discussed in the last lecture. Yeah. So we have a center of symmetry. Do we have any mirror planes? So not glide planes, but mirror planes. This one, yeah? So if I, if I um, draw a line there, you can see that reflects exactly. Yeah? So we have mirror planes. And if I look along the body diagonal, then I will see that there is a triad. Yeah? And because we have a center of symmetry, we can write that as bar 3 instead of just 3. Okay? 
everyone happy with that? I mean, you can see the triad uh, easily also in the previous slide. If I look along, along this body diagonal, then clearly there's threefold symmetry. And do you remember that the minimum requirement for something to be cubic is that we need four triads. Do you remember in the table of uh, crystal classes, we had the minimum requirements of symmetry, right? So we need, in order for something to be cubic, you must have three, uh, four triads. In other words, the four body diagonals. So, so that's the mirror plane and this is looking along a body diagonal and you can clearly see that we have a triad, okay? So the space group symmetry symbol becomes primitive, n-glide, bar three because it's a triad plus uh, a, body, a center of symmetry. Yeah, so we can invert through the center, so this becomes bar three, and we have a mirror plane. Okay? Now, of course, we can find many other symmetry elements, but the convention is that we specify these symbols by saying, look, this is along, we start by looking at the symmetry along one, zero, zero, and you remember that the glide plane was parallel to a cube edge, right? So that symbol comes first. Then we look at the symmetry along one, 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 and that gives us a, a, the bar three, the triad. Yeah? And finally, along 110, and you saw that we had that mirror plane. So this is the space group symbol for cube right. Of course, I haven't told you, uh, you know, this is a very interesting exercise, but what is the use of doing this? Yeah? But do you understand so far how to derive the space group? Yeah, by uh, assuming that the structure is known. Yeah, because I started with a known structure you can derive the space group symbol by looking at the symmetries along these axes. Everyone happy with that? Okay, now there are 32 point groups. You know, you saw the stereograms in the last lecture. And of course, because we include translational elements of symmetry, there are many, many more space groups. Something like, uh, I forget exactly, but I think it's 256 space groups. And you are never expected to remember them all, but there is uh, a large book published by the International Union of Crystallography, which has all the space groups listed in there, together with the coordinates of all the atoms inside those space groups. Okay? Now that's very important, because when you do X-ray diffraction or electron diffraction, you cannot convert the diffraction information directly into atomic positions. What you have to do is you have to guess a crystal structure and then see if you get the correct intensities and positions. Yeah? Otherwise, it would have been so easy to solve the structure of DNA. Just take a pattern and you directly get a solution. But you can't do that because you lose certain information when you take a diffraction pattern. That's the phase between the diffracted waves is lost. That means that to solve a crystal structure, you have to guess, guess the positions of atoms and then see whether your pattern is consistent with that, both in terms of the positions of the diffraction peaks or spots and in terms of intensities. And that's why it's very difficult to solve unknown structures, especially when, when they are not simple structures. Yeah? And that's why, you know, DNA solution won a Nobel Prize. You know, if it was just easy as taking a diffraction pattern, it's not worth a Nobel Prize, right? Okay? Right. Uh, so the important thing is that if you associate a certain space group with your guest crystal structure, then that will imply how many atoms you have in the unit cell. So just to illustrate this, uh, this is again your cuprite structure and uh, you know we have a triad along the body diagonal, the uh, bar three, and there's also a mirror plane going diagonally through the unit cell. So the point group uh, symmetry of this atom is that it's got a triad passing through it and there's a mirror plane parallel to that triad, right? So the point group symmetry is bar three M. So if in your guess of the crystal structure, you place an atom at a position where you have a point group symmetry bar 3m, 
that will necessarily imply that there are four such atoms in the unit cell. Because if you take that atom and you operate the symmetry elements, you will generate another three atoms. Yeah? So the total will be four. So do you understand what I'm saying? Is that the position where you place an atom, yeah, in combined with the symmetry, fixes the number of atoms you will have in the unit cell. So if you choose that position incorrectly, you might get the wrong number of atoms inside the unit cell, the wrong density of the material. So the symmetry is important when you're trying to solve for a crystal structure because you do not know where the atoms are located and you try to guess where they might be located. And if you put your atoms at the wrong position, you will generate the wrong number of atoms inside the unit cell. Okay? So you can clearly see that here, I must have these three atoms if this is a triad. Yeah? Okay? And of course, there's a triad along all of those bonds. So if I place an atom where the point group symmetry is bar 3m, it necessarily implies that I've got four copper atoms inside the unit cell. And then, you know, you've got a lattice parameter, so you know the volume of the cell. You can calculate the density and see whether that density is consistent with your measured density. That's one, one way of building up knowledge about the crystal structure. Similarly, you know, um, this is a, another, uh, this is the point group symmetry of this, um, let me see, this is copper, this is oxygen, yeah? So the point group symmetry of this oxygen atom is bar 4, 3m, because look, there is a, a tetrad going through uh, 90 degrees to the plane of the board, yeah, four-fold axis. Um, there's a triad because it's located at the body diagonal, and of course there's a mirror plane passing through there. And that symmetry will imply that you also have atoms here. Okay? So if you place that atom at an incorrect position, you might get the wrong number of atoms inside the unit cell. Do you, do you see the use of the space group, or one use of the space group? Yeah. Is when you are trying to solve unknown crystal structures. So if I take the point groups, uh, the space group symmetry of cuprite, then in this uh, book that I mentioned from the International Union of Crystallography, which is quite a thick book, you will find huge tables like this. This is for cuprite, uh, or, or specifically for the space group P n bar 3 m, which we derived, yeah? That if I place an atom where there is no symmetry, you know, it's a monad, that means I have to turn through 360 degrees to get, then there must be 48 atoms inside the cell, and it gives you all the symmetry-related positions inside the cell, okay? So placing an atom over there would require me to have 48 atoms inside the cell. So that clearly doesn't make sense compared with the structure that we know. Right? On the other hand, if I place at bar 3m, then I will have four atoms, and these are the positions of the four atoms. And if I place an atom at that, then I will have two, and that's zero, 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 and half of our. This is the correct positions of the atoms. So these tables are quite large, you know, because they deal with all the possible arbitrary positions that you can put the atoms inside the cell. And this is my abbreviated form. But the actual table will look much more complicated. I think you have it in your, in your notes. Yeah, it's on page 39, okay? Where you can see uh, this is a, still a partial listing, yeah? So if you're trying to guess a crystal structure and you think that an atom is located uh, at a place with a point group symmetry, uh, M, then you must have 24 such atoms in the unit cell. Okay? So do you understand the meaning of the space group tables? That they help you to decide where the atoms are going to be located inside the cell. And then, of course, when you make your guess, you have to check that the intensities of the diffracted beams are correct. We'll come to that later on. Yeah? Uh, 
Okay. There is a uh, there is much more use of uh, point group and space group symmetries than just working out the crystal structure. So what I want you to tell me now is what are the factors which determine the shapes of crystals? Let's just make a list of the factors which determine the shapes of crystals. Yeah. Have you ever thought why, you know, when you look in a microscope, a particular phase has a particular shape? What do you think are the factors which determine the shapes of crystals? Yeah, you know, if you look at molybdenum carbide inside steel, it forms as needles. Why does it form as needles? Needles are like this, you know. Or if you look at martensite, it forms like a plate. Why does it form like a plate? Let's just think about what determines the shape of a crystal. Any ideas? Yeah? Interface energy, very good. That's one, one. Anything else? Strain energy. And we're not restricting ourselves to equilibrium shapes. I mean, it could be the shape during the growth process. So what determines shape? What, what, what would you see if you uh, saw a partially solidified liquid? Dendritic shape, and why do dendrites happen? Hmm? Right, right, but uh, how does that lead to, a sh you are absolutely right, mm -hmm. but how does that lead to the complex shape? Yep, yep. Um, it's, uh, it's more than anisotropy, but I think anisotropy is another factor which I'm going to put down. Anisotropy. What about uh, interface stability? Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, so I'm going to begin with uh, strain energy. So uh, there are many transformations in steels where the crystal structure is changed by a deformation rather than by a diffusional process. So if you start with the parent crystal structure, it's deformed into a new crystal structure here. And because there is no diffusion, but you are changing the shape of the unit cell, you can expect to see a macroscopic change in shape. So you can physically see the shape of the crystal changing. And these, these shape changes are very, very large. Yeah? So typically, you know, an elastic strain is of the order of 10 to the minus 3. If you take the modulus of steel as 200, mega, uh, 200 gigapascals, and you apply a stress of 200 megapascals, then the strain is 10 to the minus 3. These are of the order of a quarter. Right? So they are very large. And imagine that this crystal is surrounded by many other crystals, then it's very difficult to push all those crystals. So the product will tend to occupy a shape which will minimize these pushes. Yeah? And that shape is as a thin plate. Because look, this is the displacement as I go away from the boundary. Yeah? And you can see that if I make this a very sharp tip, then the displacement here is more or less zero, right? So the thin plate shape of martensite, which you can see here, is a direct consequence of the minimization of elastic strain energy, which is by far the biggest term controlling the shape 
of martensite. So the energy here is of the order of 600 joules per mole compared with interface energy, which is much, much smaller for a, for a plate of this size. Okay? So strain energy is very important in determining the shape. Uh, you mentioned uh, dendrites, yeah? And uh, you can get dendrites both in alloys and in a pure material if you set up a, a temperature gradient which is negative in the liquid. So if you have an interface over here, my pointer is running out of battery. If you have an interface here, and if I apply a small perturbation, that means a disturbance, then it will advance into colder liquid. Yeah? So that means it becomes unstable and you get dendrite shapes like this. Okay? So this is a, a dendrite of ice in water. Yeah? Uh, when I was in China, in Harbin, in January, the temperature was minus 25 degrees centigrade. Okay? And I could see dendrites, I could see ice on the windows. Right? Now if you allow that ice to melt, then you get dendrites of water. Okay? So these are dendrites of water in ice. Now, what is this hole in the middle of all of these dendrites? Why am I getting a hole in the middle of all of those dendrites? Remember what we said about the molecule of water in a previous lecture. Yeah, so, so the density of water is higher than that of ice. So the volume of ice that has melted to give us the dendrite of water will, uh, leads to a hole in the middle. Yeah. So just to compensate for that difference in density, when the water dendrite forms, you, you must have a hole to reflect the difference in density between water and ice. Okay. And, of course, uh, most dendritic solidification occurs not because of negative temperature gradients, but because of constitutional supercooling, because of compositional differences. And uh, this, for example, uh, is dendrites of, uh, of zinc. So you take partially solidified and you remove the solid bit, and you can see dendrites in three dimensions. Okay. So interface instabilities coming from the fact that we have supercooling ahead of the interface can give rise to complex shapes. Supposing that I'm growing a, a crystal uh, which, which is growing in an isotropic medium, right? Say, let's say air, and its interfacial energy is also isotropic. It doesn't vary with orientation. Then what is the shape which minimizes interface energy? It's a sphere, right? But supposing now that the interface energy is not isotropic. That means it varies with orientation. And after all, you know, the arrangement of atoms on a 100 plane is different from a 110 plane, right? So why should interface energy be isotropic? Uh, and the way we represent an isotropy of interface energy is by drawing a diagram like this, where The distance here represents the interface energy, and the direction is a normal to the plane whose interface energy we are plotting. Okay? So here you can see there are sharp variations in interface energy as a function of the orientation of the plane. So how do we determine the equilibrium shape here? It's no, it can no longer be a sphere because look here, I've got very, very small interface energy. right? So. You know, if the crystal is growing at equilibrium, then I should get lots of interface whose orientation is along here. So if you plot the interface energy variation as a function of orientation, and then you draw planes which are tangent to these cusps in energy, then that gives you the equilibrium shape. Okay? So the equilibrium shape need not be a sphere if our interface energy varies with orientation. And here, for example, is a dendrite of niobium carbide. Yeah? 
clearly that doesn't look like the ordinary dendrites that you see. The interfacial energy is so anisotropic here that you end up with these highly crystallographic dendrites <coughs> forming in liquid iron. Yeah. So depending on how anisotropic your interfacial energy is, you might get really nice, neat, smooth dendrites, or you might get extremely crystallographically faceted dendrites. So that normally would not be recognized as a dendrite, but that's exactly dendritic form of niobium carbide. And it's growing in this way because of interfacial instabilities, just like in normal dendrites. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? Now here is uh, the very latest work done in GIFT. Okay? You can see the author over here. This is uh, showing the uh, orientation dependence of the interfacial energy of yttrium, which is hexagonal. Okay? And the c-axis of the hexagon uh, is pointing this way. And the red color implies a large interfacial energy. So if I rotate this diagram so that the c-axis is vertical, then the plot that I showed, the strange plot that I showed, looks, looks like this. Yeah? And then inside this, you can construct uh, the equilibrium shape. So this is a minimum here. So if I, if I draw a plane there, and a plane there, and a plane there, you end up with a hexagonal shape of the crystal. Now in this case, the interfacial energy of the basal plane of the hexagon is much higher than of the faces of the hexagon. So what do you think should be the shape of this crystal under equilibrium conditions? So the interfacial energy of the basal plane of the hexagon is much higher. So the crystal should grow in a way which minimizes that surface. So what, what do you think should be the shape? Yeah, a very long hexagon, right? On the other hand, if this was much smaller, then you would end up with a flat hexagon, OK? So th this is what happens with yttrium, and this is what happens with terbium, where the both are hexagonal. But here, the crystal tries to maximize the basal plane because the energy of that interface is smaller than uh, of the faces. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Right, now let's see. So we have considered uh, isolated crystals, yeah? But most of you are probably interested more in crystals being present inside other crystals, right? So that makes it more complicated because you not only have the symmetry of your precipitate to consider, but also the symmetry of the matrix, right? And whatever symmetry elements that the two will share, you know, the precipitate and the matrix, will if other factors don't come in, we'll determine the shape of the precipitate. So I'll give you one example, and you know, this is from uh, Frederick's past life. Yeah? It's on aluminium. Okay. <laughs> so aluminium uh, is uh, cubic F, so the space group symbol is F, and it is uh, the most symmetrical form of uh, cube. You know, if you look at the point group tables and you go down the column for the cube, this is the most symmetrical point group that you can get, m bar 3m, with four, uh, four tetrads, four triads, and plenty of dyads and mirror planes and so forth. Yeah? So that's aluminum. And inside aluminum, you can get a silver-rich precipitate, which is known as omega, which is also cubic f, but uh, sorry, it's, a, um, it's autorhombic f, because this is the point group for an autorhombic lattice. Do you remember that MMM belonging to autorhombic? We had either gypsum or epsomite was autorhombic, yeah? So this is autorhombic F, so face-centered autorhombic. And the orientation relationship that you get between the omega precipitate and the aluminum is that 001 of omega is parallel to 111 of aluminum. So 111 is, of course, a triad. And this is, what is the symmetry of this axis? Yeah, uh, so 
You're, you're quite right, but uh, mirror would be normal to that axis. But what is the rotation axis? Hmm? Uh, yeah, dyad, because it's orthorhombic. Yeah, so there's no fourfold axis. Yeah, so that's a dyad. And this is another, another dyad. And this. Diet as well. Yeah? Okay, so let's see now what are the common symmetry elements that these two share in this orientation relationship, right? So this is our point group table, and um, this is the symmetry of the aluminium, and that's the symmetry of the omega. Uh, omega belongs to the orthorhombic class, and this is the cubic class, right? So I'll just increase the magnification there. So here we have the point group for omega and the point group for aluminium. Now let's just see if there's any symmetry shared over here. So we have a dyad and a triad. Is there anything common? Yeah, if I superimpose a dyad on a triad, is there any common symmetry element? No. Because a triad is rotation by 120 degrees, a dyad by 180 degrees. So there's nothing common, right? And there is a mirror plane. Uh, these are now bold lines. So I explained to you that if there are bold lines, then there are mirror planes. So for every dyad, there is a mirror plane at 90 degrees. Yeah? So for this dyad, there's a mirror plane there. Now, for the triad, is there a mirror plane at 90 degrees? No, because look, uh, in order for the mirror plane to be there at 90 degrees, this would be at 90 degrees, and there's no mirror plane. Yeah? This is red. You can see this is red, right? Yeah, that's not a mirror, a mirror plane. The mirror planes are these, 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 and all those. Yeah? Maybe I should dim the lights a little bit. So there's no common symmetry along there. Okay. Now let's examine uh, this case. Um, this is a dyad, and this is a dyad. So what's the common symmetry? Dyad. dyad. Okay. And this dyad has a mirror plane at 90 degrees to it. Yeah. You can see this red mirror plane. And does this dyad or any other dyad have a mirror plane at 90 degrees? Any ideas? Well, well, what about this? Does this have a mirror plane at 90 degrees to it? Yeah, this one here. Can you see? And similarly, you've got a diode here, and this will be at 90 degrees to that. So every diode in the aluminium has a mirror plane at 90 degrees. So this has a mirror plane at 90 degrees. This, uh, sorry, this has a mirror plane at 90 degrees. So does this. So what would I write the common symmetry as? We know the diode is common, and we know the mirror plane. How would I write that as a point group symbol? 2 over m, because the mirror plane is at 90 degrees. Yeah? So the symmetry of a precipitate should be 2 over m. The shape of a precipitate should, you know, there should be a diode in the shape of the precipitate, and there should be a mirror plane in its shape at 90 degrees to that diet. Yeah? So let's just see that a bit more. So here is, uh, this is how the precipitate really looks. OK? And you can see that there's a diet there. Yeah? And furthermore, the, this is an exact reflection of this part. So the shape of this precipitate reflects the common symmetry elements between the two crystals. And notice that this is the diffraction pattern from omega in this orientation relationship. So these two are in exactly the correct relative orientation. So you know, you've got 0, 0, 001 uh, of omega parallel to a 110 type direction of the aluminum. And this one parallel to the 111 direction, which goes this way. Yeah? 
And again, you know, the shared symmetry between these two is two. So you can clearly see there's a dyad for both of these diffraction patterns. Yeah? If I rotate by 180 degrees about here, then I recover exactly the previous pattern. And similarly, there's a mirror plane at 90 degrees. So by looking at the space group of the matrix and the precipitate and finding what the shared symmetry is for the observed correct orientation relationship, you could, in principle, predict the shape of the precipitate, assuming that none of the other factors are controlling the shape. Yeah. So I've given you, I think, two examples of how to use space groups and point groups. The first one is to determine the crystal structure, okay? Because if you locate your atoms at the wrong positions, then you will get the wrong density. Okay? And of course, you'll get the wrong intensity as well. The second thing is that the shape of the precipitate might be determined by the common symmetry between the matrix and the precipitate. Yeah? So it's quite interesting, you know, that the omega precipitates have exactly this shape inside aluminium. Any questions? Okay, now don't forget to submit your uh, question sheets on time. And I don't mind if you discuss, discuss the questions among yourself, but the deadline is absolutely strict. You won't get a mark if you don't submit it uh, to, by the end of tomorrow. Okay? Sorry, I have a question about the class of tomorrow. Do we have yeah. tomorrow? Yes, yes. Uh, why? Because in on COVID, the timetable on COVID, there, there was no class on Friday. Oh, is that right? Um, as far as I, I am concerned, uh, you are all free, right? At 8 o'clock tomorrow. Yes. So we will have a class here at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Yeah? Okay? Thank you.